No price talk and no Lambos. This is not another crypto podcast. Welcome to Ignition. I'm your host, Gillian Godsell, and each week we will be looking at the problems solved by blockchain. I'll be going deep, deep with the people building the apps and communities which are changing the world around us. So hello and welcome to EOS Dublin's podcast, Ignition, with me, Gillian Gotzel. And in these series of interviews, I've been talking to a lot of men, a lot of men as it happens, actually, yes, that's not a lot of women, but on the EOS blockchain, but in particular with regard to Europe Chain. And today I have the CEO of the Europe Chain project, and I'm going to have trouble with your name here. It's Rhett Oatkirk Pool. Am I saying that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. And again, a man again. Yeah, A man, so, I know. Uh, another man, I know. Yeah. We need more women. But um, no, thank you so much. And Rhett, you have been traveling all over the world. We've been trying to connect and our time zones have got out of sync. And, you know, I'm getting calls at two o'clock. Like, I'm not awake and I'm ringing you. And you're going, I'm, I'm not even in that country anymore. Yeah. <laughs> so you're a very busy man. So you're yeah, very welcome to the podcast. And what I'd like to do is just chat about, I want to go backwards before I go forwards. Europe chain is my focus today. But just to understand a bit about you, Rhett, I was going through your LinkedIn and a lot of it's in Dutch. So I'm going to go, mm. and then I went, oh, Royal, Royal Navy. So you, you were saying you were uh, mature enough to have been a compulsory recruit in the Navy. Yeah, yeah. A long time wow. ago. Uh, wow. That you was don't, required. And may, and may I say for those of us who, who are we're all on podcasts, whatever, you don't look old enough to be. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, mm, the, uh, Thank you. Doing very well. Yeah. So you were in the, how long were you in the Navy for? Well, at that time, everybody did, needed to do uh, compulsory service for a year. And uh, many people did uh, very lousy jobs. Mm-hmm. And I didn't want to do that. So I, I applied for an officer job and got recruited. And then I was lucky enough to be uh, in the submarine division of the Dutch Navy. Mm-hmm. So I've, I have been 200 meters underwater. So I'm, I, I had a very, very, very interesting uh, I admire you. Time, so yeah. you're, you're right, because I mean, not we in, here in Ireland, we don't have compulsory service. We've ever had it. Obviously, the British Army at once it would have had it, but not in, not here in Ireland. But that's interesting. So you took a you know almost like a, a, a bad thing and made it into a positive. You said, if I have to do compulsory service, let's make it worthwhile. Good yes. plan. Good plan. And I love the fact yeah. submarines. Was that very scary and claustrophobic being under all that water? Well, I, I've been. I had a mental test for three days, and uh, I passed it. Wow. So with every girlfriend I met, I say, I'm one of the most stable guys you ever meet. So. <laughs> <laughs> every girlfriend. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you, I, have you settled down now, Rhett? Have you yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, I'm, I settled down. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Good, good. Yeah. It's, it's just very funny. With every girlfriend, it implies that. <laughs> I'm <a> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, that wasn't my intent. No, <laughs> no I, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. Yeah. We're in different time zones. Okay. Yeah. So you went, and I, I, well, I admire, that's a really, A, it's interesting. Wow to be a submarine and an officer there, but B, also at, say, to make a positive out of a negative. That's really strong. So after that, and you worked with the Fokker aircraft. Also interesting. What was that? What were you doing there? And Fokker, is not, there's two different streams of thoughts about where we got the curse word, the F-U-C-K, the F-bomb word. And some people say it's from the Fokkers, the airplanes. Other people say it's, it's Anglo-Saxon. Which story have you heard? I, this is the first time I hear it, but I, I think it's, I don't know, it, I don't know where it Here comes come from. Here come the Fokkers. <laughs> no, the, the, the Fokker aircraft was a, a Dutch airplane manufacturer. And mm. due to uh, the differences between the dollar and the European currency, that uh, company went down. Right. Um, and um, I worked there a little over a year. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was a little bit of fun, but not so much fun because... Uh, they were already in financial problems. Okay. And that Good. learned yeah, that learned me that you have to work for a company that is doing what you what you are doing. So if you are in IT, you should work for IT. If you're in cybersecurity, you should work in cybersecurity and not in cybersecurity for a company that makes uh, milk. That okay. is a challenging job. So, yes. So, and, and you actually chose in the next part of your career, I'm looking through your LinkedIn, which is a lot in Dutch, but the, the titles, I can pick out cybersecurity. That was, that's one of your key areas, I understand. Yeah, I, I moved to uh, an IT services company and then the internet started and I was very passionate about that. And the similar thing now happens with blockchain. Um, so we're, we're in the early days, we're building this new uh, internet and I did that 
at that time as well. First for uh, somebody else, then we uh, uh, did a lot of cybersecurity. It wasn't called cybersecurity, it was called firewalls and stuff like that. So we sold firewalls, implemented them, mm-hmm. and then uh, at a certain stage, I started my own company. Um, and is that the Kahuna that I got that yeah, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah okay. Yeah. I've and been how- doing that for 20 years. Yeah, 21 years, and, it says here, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, I res- resigned my uh, my CEO position uh, last year. Okay. When I started the uh, US. Uh, yeah, okay. I, I got so enthusiastic about EOS and, and blockchain technology in general. Mm-hmm. And it also has a, a base in the security because I was responsible for a product portfolio as well, of course. And mm-hmm. securing an IT network is a challenge. One day I had a customer, a new customer. He just inv- invested, I don't know, something like five million in new data center, new server X, new network, everything top of the, top of the line. And, and, and he became a new client and he liked our approach. And he asked me, can you make like a three-year plan for us of what we need to, to do more? Mm-hmm. I said, okay, but I don't know you so well. So do you have anything that I can use to base my strategy or can we do a series of interviews? He said, well, I have a PCI Days S Delta and uh, report because in the UK, we need to be compliant to the, the laws that the credit cards, not the laws, but the regulations that credit card companies are requesting us to be compliant to. Mm. And they were, they had a normal IT infrastructure, just new setup. Company was in business for 10 to 15 years, and their new generation of IT uh, data center products was installed. Mm-hmm. They did a PCI Days S Delta check, and they implemented, they found out that they had 85% of the measurements of, uh, of the PCI Days S not implemented. They were only, they only had 15% implemented. Wow. So that was a, a simple job for us because we could take this, uh, this report mm-hmm. and say, okay, if you want to go to 100%, you need to purchase this, you need to implement that, you need to do this, and you need to do that, and you need to do that. And the total proposal was 2.7 million. Mm-hmm. And of course, he, he fell, off, fell off his chair, as you <laughs> say in Dutch. Because we say it in English too. <laughs> yeah, he bought a new data center. He thought he had purchased something decent, yeah. five million, and to secure it was two point seven million. Then mm. this CIO said, "Well, this is a bit of a problem." Yes. Um, and I think that also, I, I, I mean, I knew that because in many cases, budget for security products was an issue. Mm-hmm. But it also shows that it's very unrealistic to have. What is it? Almost 60% additional to have it a little bit of secure. So mm. we need to have a new type of IT infrastructure and uh, blockchain can provide that. Blockchain and, can. And is, yeah. is, is that how you came? I mean, obviously you're, you're an early adopter with the internet. You're working with cybersecurity or firewalls as it was known then. When did you first come across blockchain? I mean, we, we know how it works now, but when, when did you first see it? Was it back in the early days or? Yeah, of course, I, I know that for five years, but I, uh, then you read something and then you have this lunatic saying, code is law. And I said, oh, come to my security operation and see how much code is law. <laughs> because I have a help desk, a support desk with problems because code can never be law. There's always bugs. Yeah. Uh, there's been huge incidents where just in the basis of the IT products were holes as big as a, windows on the first floor and back doors in the ground floor and so we can't have code as law it's impossible Mm -hmm. we need uh, a mechanism that and then i bumped into a us and then if that was saw some movies of dan larimer then i said okay this guy understands that we're living in the real world not some philosophical or political or no, we're living in a real world with real mm-hmm. customers, with real environments, with real governments, and we can't say that they don't exist and and try to make a new utopian world. No, just we have to embed uh, this technology and decentralization is a is a brilliant thing. So mm-hmm. we'll, we'll we'll see big changes, but 
we don't we cannot in, ignore what we have right now so that's what i liked about eos the more practical and everybody in this space has that and the understanding that we we want to go to a new uh, world where we have a, an internet of value where we have the de- decentralization where we have we give back the power to to the, the normal people again and mm. uh, yeah with with this technology that's possible but we can't change it overnight we have to take proper steps so that's what i like about the us yeah and then the <laughs> chinese the chinese come in and say oh we just want to make money so <laughs> <laughs> Everyone just wants to make money, I think. Yeah. <laughs> now, that's quite interesting because, um, yeah, when I talk to my friends, people who are not involved in this area at all, I can say, no, it's the technology, it's the technology. And then when in, in my uh, journeys uh, so far as a journalist, I interview some very interesting people who it is ideological, it is political, and they have some really interesting thought processes, which I admire. I don't necessarily agree with them all, but it's I like the way they're thinking. It's, it's different ways. But you're, into, you're, you're, you're saying this product works, this platform works, but let's do it incrementally and let's do it in a practical sense. So let's not throw out the baby with the bathwater yes. expression. So now that is cool. And the EOS platform for you is a practical implementation of blockchain. Yes. And so when, so you decided to become an EOS block producer, what sort of, and you resigned from your CEO of your Kahuna company. So what was that like? You suddenly said, yes, I see the light and I'm going to do this. Or how did that come about? Well, there's two parts of that story. First of all, I, I broke my leg in 2017. Mm, sorry to hear that. So I wasn't able to work for four months and that created already some distance between the company and me because I wasn't there all the day, all day. Yes, and so the the organization started to learn or get accustomed to the fact that I wasn't there all the time, mm-hmm. and I was partly living in Portugal, partly living in Amsterdam. So that the whole it was like a natural, uh, slowly step backwards, step backwards. Mm-hmm. That I and then after twenty years, it was, it's good to do something else. I mean, yes, yeah. I think I got a little blind. I was doing everything on the automatic pilot, and and I just got very interested in 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 doing something else. And and EOS was the, the mm-hmm. ecosystem that really appealed to me a lot. So I was uh, spending was cool. more attention to that than attention to my own company and. I was fortunate to find some good other good people that uh, that I have the trust that they can run because I'm still the shareholder of mm-hmm. the company. So they are running now uh, Kahuna. So I have the energy and the time and the and the focus to put attention to the EOS ecosystem. And then that ended up to we had a lot of ideas in the EOS Amsterdam ecosystem. Uh, we traveled to London, we traveled to San Francisco, we met the whole ecosystem. My partners went to Seoul and Shanghai also. And so we really started to understand how it works, what it is, what the benefits are, where the customers want something. And then I, I thought, we have this GDPR that makes Europe a little different. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I took the initiative to see if other Block producers felt uh, interested in starting this sister chain. And uh, yeah, we got some good people behind the plan, basically. So that's how it started. It's and so cool. how I, I got detached from, uh, from Kahuna. Yeah. I was going to say, I'm responding to your career hiatus. The last time I had one of those, I had a baby. <laughs> yeah. You had a baby at a company. It's, the new births come from different hiatuses or yeah. IT. So now with the Europe chain. Okay, so you're mentioning their GDPR, which is obviously a huge thing. And as I point out when I did these interviews, GDPR is not just for European citizens or for citizens of the EU, I should say, given the imminent Brexit. But anyone doing business with somebody, with a company in the EU, they have to be GDPR compliant. So that's a huge thing that the world is still sort of grappling with and having nightmares over. So tell me a bit, bit more about the Europe chain. How do you envisage it working? Yeah, if, if you read every academic paper on GDPR and blockchain, um, there's a few that says, well, it's a balanced risk, uh, balanced uh, regulation, so it could be implemented if you can put everything off chain and uh, consider a couple of other things. And then there's a few documents saying it cannot be done because uh, an account is 
or a, a public private key is uh, or can be in the future always traced back to an individual, a data subject. So forget about blockchain and GDPR, it cannot be done. So if you say that to an entrepreneur, then he always starts. It's a thinking, challenge. Oh, yeah, that's mm-hmm. it. Okay, how can we tweak, change uh, EOS IO in such a way that we can help our customers uh, yeah. with blockchain technology and all the advantages that it has and still make it GDPR compliant? And basically, we, we discussed this with, uh, with the team. Mm-hmm. And we came... Uh, yeah, I think we're pretty confident that we designed something that can work. So, yeah, wow. that's what we did. So you're offering, am I right in understanding that what the Europe chain is offering, traditional companies that maybe want blockchain, need GDPR, but want a more traditional way of onboarding their solutions, applications, whatever, into this environment? We are solving a couple of problems. First, we're we're solving this GDPR, so we're, mm-hmm. we will configure EOS IO with European block producers in such a way that it is uh, compliant with the regulations. Mm-hmm. Secondly, we will provide it as a, as a service, so it's cloud service, blockchain as a service. We'll just simply invoice in euros to those That's clients. That's another point too as well, isn't it? The, in, the yeah. euros, yeah, it's not... They don't have to mess about with funny wallets and stuff like that. Yes. Well, in, in, at the end, you will have to because that is how the system works. Mm-hmm. But for an enterprise that wants to start and just don't need user accounts, then you don't even have to use the wallets. But yep. at the end, you will have to utilize the Europe chain uh, tokenomics as well. But at first, if you just want 100 transactions per week, then you just purchase 100 transactions per week. Also because the the whole token thing, if you look at the bookkeeping rules, the IFRS rules, it's very mm-hmm. unclear how to, mm-hmm. how to put that on your balance sheet. So for companies, there are some challenges. That's why you see the IBMs and the, the other companies that provide blockchain services also uh, just use Hyperledger or use Corda and we pray, basically want to do the same, but then not using Hyperledger and Corda, but using EOSIO because we mm-hmm. think that is the, the strongest platform out there and it works in a certain way. Okay, let's have that certain way of working now yeah. implemented uh, for European enterprises, for European customers, for European users within the framework that we have to deal with GDPR, IFRS rules. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's cool. and, and also the other element that you're offering uh, businesses that want to get into this space is that you're reputable, you're transparent, you're European, so they can come over and meet you, shake your hand. And the worries about traditional businesses might have about the whole blockchain is they go, oh, Silk Road, Ponzi scheme, whatever. And you're going, no, we're, we're real businessmen and women. I presume some women there too yeah. as well. But, <laughs> but um, so it's, it's, it's that stability and, um, you know, you, you're real credible companies. Yes. Management team that has experience in running serious operations. Uh, we have a, a Slack group of uh, 50 people that is working on it right now. We have a, a core team of nine from the four founding uh, block producers. We try to keep away of this anarchistic crypto money, keep away from, from uh, unregulated countries. Uh, so no island uh, LTDs, but uh, just legitimate uh, businesses. And with mm-hmm. islands, I don't mean Ireland. No. But, uh, <laughs> like this small island. <laughs> yeah, no, there's a lot of people that just is, are not looking into the, the legal. I mean, blockchain is a is signature engine. So if you can base that on uh, existing rules and regulations, then the whole blockchain gets a lot stronger. So that's what we're doing. We just put it on top of Dutch law, European regulations, just make it very, very serious and uh, do everything by the book Yeah. because enterprises want that trust. It is a trust structure. So solving that with this technology and do it in a way it should be done and pay your taxes, uh, then this is what enterprises need. Yeah, perfect. And so just to finish off then, Rhett, 
when will this be up and running, do you think? An idea of roadmaps? Well, we don't have a clear path. Right now, we're raising uh, capital to do the second phase of rollout. I think we can roll, we can start the chain without this uh, fundraising that we're currently doing. Mm. But uh, of course, to really get the enterprises in Europe behind this plan <laughs> as a customer, yeah. we need to reach out to them. And cost of sales is always very expensive, but we, mm-hmm. need, uh, we need to reach out to enterprises and, and explain that we're here, what we do, and uh, for that we need some money. Um, yeah. Spinning up the chain, we can do with the current investments. We have architected what we need. We have defined our product and services. We have uh, uh, written the constitution. So we, we have some steps to take before we can launch. Mm. And I think we're on 80% of that. So spinning up the chain could be done in the next two months. Uh, wow. Really going out to clients and get the first and it will not be one chain, uh, maybe the topic we didn't touch, but mm-hmm. the Europe chain will offer one public chain yeah. so that people know that we're out there. You can run yeah. your application on that public chain, but we really think there's a large market for running not a 21 node EOS architecture, but like say a seven node for, I don't know, a hotel chain that says I have uh, 50 hotels, two data centers, what you recommend me to do. Then we mm. say, okay, we can spin up a seven node for you. On looking at your topology, it would be smart to do it like this. And then we spin up seven node nodes instead of uh, 21 nodes yeah. for economic reasons. Of course, uh, yeah. And then it's a dedicated private chain that they built their applications on top of. Mm-hmm. That's cool. So... That makes sense. Yeah, so you have the public chain, but then also for each industry, you'd look at um, dedicated chains for economic reasons. And you're right, they don't need the full yeah. 51 nodes, whatever. So that's kind of cool. All right. Well, that sounds fascinating. I love the idea. It's And again, do you know what, it, what it's doing? Even though you're sort of saying we're not the whole, the whole talk about blockchains and being anarchistic and all the rest of it, but what you are doing is the mass adoption, the enterprise adoption, and it's taking it at a very, a very measure. We are business people. Let's, let's work this way. So I, I really admire that standpoint. Yeah, and it's open also for all startups. Uh, I mean, that's also, uh, of course, a target audience. But uh, to spin it up and get it embraced by a bigger mm-hmm. uh, group of people, you need, and that's also if you look at what, what Block One says and people that have seen, for example, I've seen the wallet that Block One builds. Mm-hmm. Um, they are implementing something that can embrace thousands of side chains and that's the model that uh, will and then and second stage we will have inter blockchain communication we will have dApps that utilize that uh, we'll probably have a very strong identity platform decentralized and then yeah you can connect all the ecosystem components and the Europe chain is also doing that so we we intend to have all kinds of partnerships with people in this ecosystem and facilitate that for our partners in this uh, endeavor. Mm-hmm. Uh, if we have, for example, this France EOS said we're interested, they will become one of our block producers. But companies like uh, Plantin, I like them, uh, they have something like proof of location. That's very interesting to be to offer to clients in France, but Plantin don't want, doesn't want to sign reseller contracts or partnership contracts with 28 countries and all the block producers in there. No, they, I think they will like it if we facilitate that. So we have all the resellers, all the block producers in Europe will be our resellers. They can have local deals in France. We implement on the back end partnerships with interesting components mm-hmm. and together we can build solutions for our customer base. Wow. So, yeah, I think yes. it's a good plan. Yeah, no, very ambitious, but I like where you're coming from. And I think you're talking for businesses that are looking for a path into blockchain, and especially yeah. in, in, the e, in the EU, it's a very comfortable, it's a comfortable path. You kind of, it, there, are, there are milestones and, and noises that sound very familiar rather than, yeah, let's get rid of the government. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so cool. 
Okay, listen, thank you so much for your time today, Rhett. That was amazing. And I know you're running around again. You're, you're popping off onto planes and you're not, not traveling at the moment. But I thank you for your time. And you've been listening to Rhett Outkirk, who, who's a CEO of uh, EOS Amsterdam and the CEO of uh, EuropeChain.io as well. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you for having me.